Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm kind of far back today, so I'll, I get to get a different perspective a little bit. But uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and welcome to our briefing, Congress and International Climate Finance. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Um, this is the kickoff to our briefing series, What Congress Needs to Know About COP28, uh, and generally speaking, our extensive resources covering the UNFCCC, and that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations in general. For the next couple months, that'll be sort of the main thing that we're working on because it's really important for Congress to understand not just what the U.S. is up to, but also Congress plays really important roles, in fact, an essential role in the U.S. living up to our Paris Agreement goals. I'd like to start by thanking our friends uh, in the office of Representative Paul Tonko and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition for hosting us today and helping us get this great room. Uh, very briefly, EESI, uh, our work dates back to 1984. Uh, we were established by a bipartisan member, a group of members of Congress to provide policymaker education to members of Congress and their staff. Uh, and that is largely what we are concerned with these days. Um, Briefings like this are our highest profile activity, but we also do articles and issue briefs and fact sheets, uh, podcasts, newsletters, all sorts of things. Uh, and the whole idea is to help congressional staff have access, free access, to uh, nonpartisan science-based information about climate change topics. Um, over the years, uh, we have also uh, developed some expertise helping rural utilities access programs at the Department of Agriculture and specifically in order to establish inclusive on-bill financing programs for energy efficiency uh, and electrification. Um, but today we're here to talk about COP. Um, this is the first of our three-part briefing series. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we do a lot of, we have a lot of issue coverage, right? Co climate change is a big topic. It covers lots of ground. And so that means our resources cover a lot of ground as well. For example, back on September 12th, we had a briefing about uh, research and development in the Farm Bill. Uh, farm Bill, that was the sixth of our briefing series about the Farm Bill. Uh, at some point, we'll start working on a Farm Bill. I know a lot of people are actually working on it right now uh, behind the scenes, um, but it was really important for us to have those resources available for staff before uh, the actual debate starts to occur around the Farm Bill. We also have some really, really impressive uh, hearing trackers uh, going back a couple years. We also have some really cool side-by-side-by-sides -side -side that eventually will be updated with text as we get it. Uh, and the whole idea is to help staff. Everybody is going to be a Farm Bill staff person at some point during the debate, and so it helps everyone get up to speed very quickly. We also had a briefing back on September 28th I wanted to mention. It was the first in our new series called IIJA and IRA Progress Report. This one was all about the tax incentives that were enacted as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. We had nine panelists talking about over a dozen tax incentives. If you'd like to get a quick overview about where those stand, uh, I can't recommend that briefing enough. We had a, a tremendous um, group of experts. Everything I've mentioned and everything uh, and a lot more is all available and for free online at www.eesi.org. You may say, well, that's fine, but how could I get all of this delivered to my email inbox every two weeks? Well, we have a great newsletter uh, called Climate Change Solutions, and it's the best way to keep up with everything that we're doing, and I encourage all of you to subscribe. Um, we uh, are here today, though, to start our coverage of COP28. Um, our coverage uh, has expanded in the last couple years, um, but we always start with briefing series. Today, it doesn't quite feel like it because it's in the 70s, but today is the start of COPtober. And then after this, we'll get to COPvember, and then COPsember, and then we'll come back in January with some cool new briefings. But I'm really not kidding when our emphasis is going to be on this for the next couple months. Uh, there's a lot for you all to understand. And the last thing we would want is for a Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock, your boss to come by your desk and say, hey, what happened at COP today? Or what's international climate finance? Or what's an MDB? Or what's a global stock take? My goal is for you to say, well, boss, uh, let me go to www.esi.org and I'll find out and get right back to you. And you can be on your way back to the district or your state. And you can have uh, a, a nice wheels up party at the end of the day. Uh, that's our goal here at ESI. But now we're here to talk about COP. While investments in climate change uh, can be expensive, or climate action can be expensive, the impacts of climate change at home and abroad can be even more costly. And this will be a major topic addressed at COP28, and the stakes couldn't be any higher. Our panelists will help us understand the issues and contexts uh, and roles of different actors like MDBs, multilateral development banks, and answer questions like, with demand for climate-related finance increasing around the globe, 
what levers are available to Congress to scale up financial flows? And how does Congress's approach to international climate finance impact actions by the private sector, multilateral development banks, and other global financial institutions? Uh, really couldn't come up with four better people uh, to help us answer those questions today. And to help us get started, it is my privilege to introduce a special guest, Representative Adriano Espeat, represents the 13th District, 13th District of New York. First elected to Congress in 2016, Representative Espeat is the first Dominican American to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. He serves on the House Committee on Appropriations and is the ranking member of the Legislative Branch Subcommittee. And additionally, or additionally, he serves on the House Budget Committee. He's deputy chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. And we're really fortunate to have him joining us today by video. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Congressman Adriano Espaya, and I am honored to welcome you to this important briefing by the Environmental and Energy Study Institute on Congress and International Climate Finance. I had the privilege of attending COP27 last year in Egypt, where I witnessed firsthand the urgency of the global community to act to prevent the effects of climate change from becoming permanent. The United States has a responsibility to lead the global effort to fight climate change. We need to work together with our allies and partners to ensure that we mobilize adequate resources to support developing countries in transition to low carbon and climate resilience development. That is why I am delighted to introduce today's panel of experts who will share their insights on the role of Congress in scaling up climate finance and its impact on global climate action. Please join me in welcoming them, them today. Great. Uh, well, thank you to uh, Representative uh, Espeat and his great staff for helping him join us today. Um, we were also in Egypt last year, and it was quite the experience, and we'll be back in Dubai for the first week uh, of COP28. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to let you know that we'll have a Q&A period at the end of our session today. So for folks in the room, uh, we'll have a roving microphone, uh, and uh, we can take questions from the audience. If you're in our online audience, and I know we have a lot of people watching online, you can uh, send us questions two ways. One, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K at ESI.org. You can also follow us on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, uh, at ESI Online, and get us that way. We are also going to be uh, on Instagram today at the same handle, um, but, uh, but I think the you know, X and uh, uh, email is probably the best way for today. Unfortunately, we had a little bit of a change in schedule today, and Bella Tonkinogi uh, with the Climate Policy Initiative is not available to join us. She's ill today, um, which is a bummer because Bella is amazing. Um, fortunately, um, we have four other amazing panelists who are real experts uh, on international climate finance. Um, if you would like to um, see Bella's slides, those are available online. Uh, Bella's slides are also included in the packet you picked up when you walked in the door. Um, we will um, uh, do our best to make up for her absence today. We all wish her uh, best wishes and we want her to get well soon. Uh, perhaps she's watching us online, we'll see. Uh, so everyone needs to be on best behavior just in case. Um, but uh, to help us uh, fill uh, Bella's absence today, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, and I'm going to start by introducing Stacy Swan. Uh, Stacy has more than 25 years of experience in climate finance, project finance, impact investment, climate change, and sustainability. Her experience includes building and shaping organizations, leading teams, and delivering practical approaches to organizational and operational management primarily in the climate and investment space. She's founder of Resilient Earth Capital, an investor community with a mission to accelerate investment in climate companies. Uh, as CEO and founder of uh, Climate Finance Advisors, she led the firm through its early establishment, achieving more than 100% average annual growth since uh, 2015, it, when it was founded. And in 2022, she shepherded the firm through a successful acquisition. Uh, she has held senior and executive positions with the International Finance Corporation, as well as the U.S. Department of Treasury and other organizations. Stacy, I'm going to invite you up to the lectern to look at the spaghetti slide uh, and help us get started, and then we'll resume with the rest of our program. Thank you. So, um, also not included in my bio is I happen to be a board member of CPI, so I feel very comfortable kind of presenting on behalf of Bella at least one thing that's important for the context of this conversation. Um, 
And uh, please do look at Bella's um, other slides and uh, the presentation that um, is delivered later because she will kind of give a lot of flavor to what you're about to see. But um, so uh, Climate Policy Initiative has been around for more than a decade. And one of the things that they are best known for is tracking climate finance flows. And this is really important to understand kind of where public dollars go, where private dollars come from, how public dollars leverage private dollars, um, what, they're, um, what they're used for. So um, here on, if you want to kind of break down how the spaghetti diagram, how to read the spaghetti diagram, you have sources and intermediaries on the left side. These are balance sheets of various types, including government official development assistance, ODA, or aid money all the way down to, um, they also track kind of corporate funding and, and um, financial institutions and private finance. Um, as you move kind of from left to right, uh, they then track how those flows move through different instruments. So if you're not somebody who spends a lot of time in the financial sector, this is pretty important because money goes out in different flavors. Um, obviously there's grants, but there's a whole bunch of other ways that money is allocated towards climate and climate related investments. Um, and they have um, uh, tracked the flows uh, through the different instruments that they go out into the world as. Grants, low cost project debt, we'll get to this a little later, I'm sure. Uh, project level market rate debt, um, project level equity, um, some balance sheet financing, and some balance sheet financing that's equity. So when you look at Bella's information and when she is um, able to present around this, she'll go deep into some of these things. And it's really important to understand how these instruments work and how the flows through these instruments go. But then, of course, from a policy perspective, um, they, uh, CPI does a wonderful job at dividing uh, these flows into how they're use, used from a climate perspective, adaptation versus mitigation. And you can see in last year's accounting, the the majority of the flows that went internationally around climate finance were for mitigation related activities. Um, if you're not in the climate space, mitigation in this particular sense is energy and energy transition and energy efficiency. It's not the kind of mitigation that you would hear FEMA talk about, for example, which is more, you know, reinforcing kind of hard infrastructure. Um, but they divide the uses into adaptation and mitigation because the climate, um, international climate discussion usually talks about funding for adaptation and mitigation. And then they also do a really good job at breaking down the flows that they track into different sectors. So how much is going towards climate-related water uh, investments? How much goes towards climate-related energy systems? How much goes towards climate-related transport systems? So this is really something, if you, if you go to CPI's website and look at the research and the data that they track, um, really as a kind of international um, best practice around tracking these flows, um, they do a really good job at kind of really going under the hood and, and seeing where, where things kind of are going and how they're going. Um, I don't want to say too much more because this is kind of um, something you'll hear from Bella um, at a future date, but really uh, CPI is one of those organizations that does this the best. Um, I will also say a lot of these flows are international. Um, they started out their tracking um, mostly on international flows. Uh, there's great need to do the same thing here in the United States, and I know CPI is working on that particular slice. They have also looked at flows for different types of um, countries and sectors, so water in Brazil, for example. You can probably look on their website and see flows to that. So there's a great resource for understanding kind of how the climate finance landscape of financial flows moves. Um, so I will stop there and come back uh, on a different topic. Thank you. That was uh, very, very helpful. Really, really appreciate you filling in for that, Stacy. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I am from Climate Policy Initiative. We are an analytical and advisory nonprofit organization with deep expertise in policy and finance as it relates to climate action. We help governments, businesses, and financial institutions drive economic growth while addressing climate change. And amongst nonprofits, we're unique in our focus in particular on climate finance. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today our global trends in climate finance, CPI, 
since 2011 has run a global climate finance tracking program, which drives evidence-based and informed discussions on climate finance. So in that program, we develop comprehensive analysis of finance flows. We um, analyze data on progress against needs for climate finance. And then finally, we produce concrete and actionable recommendations. And we've just released in early November the latest edition of our global landscape of climate finance, which tracks global climate finance flows um, from all different sources all the way through where the destinations of those climate finance flows are. And we've been doing that since our first report back in 2011. So to give you an overview of what that report includes. So first of all, average annual climate finance flows reached almost $1.3 trillion most recently. So we track that data. It was an average annual amount for 2021 and 2022. And so that has doubled, nearly doubled compared to four years ago, which is indeed a, quite a noteworthy milestone. And that large uptick was primarily driven by a significant acceleration in mitigation finance by $440 billion from the annual average back in 2019 and 2020. And then the remainder of the growth observed stems from one from methodological improvements and also from new data sources, which resulted in additional finance flows of $173 billion. So you can see that on the chart at the top right as well. And then just a quick clarification on what we track and don't track. Our analysis covers new annual primary finance flows into climate mitigation and climate adaptation. It means we really focus on real economy change on the ground climate investment at project level, like the investment going into building renewable power plants or building the adaptive capacity of local communities. So moving on, we um, now we know that that increase of finance is of course really great news, however, there's still a significant gap between those current flows and what's needed for a low carbon and climate resilient development trajectory. And this graph here depicts what that reality check looks like. And what we've calculated in our most recent needs assessment is that at least $5.9 trillion in annual investment is required by 2030. And those, this range of investment needs presented on this graph are based on publicly available data and scenarios across different sectors, such as energy, agriculture, industry, and adaptation. And it's not an exact science, but it does give an indication of the magnitude of the funds needed. So what are we finding in terms of who's delivering that climate finance? So first we look at um, public sector versus private sector finance. And the overall share of tracked climate finance provided by public sources, which is that blue rectangle, is slightly more than half of the total. Both have actually increased quite substantially since our last study. Both of that have approximately doubled. So we're seeing an acceleration in both the public and private sectors. But if we are to really achieve those goals of those climate finance needs, mobilizing private finance at scale is really important given what, what we will continue to see as limited public budgets. We need to get private finance going to climate mitigation and adaptation activities and really get a step change going in that. In terms of public finance, development finance institutions continue to provide the majority of public finance. Um, and for private investment, commercial financial institutions and corporations really provide the vast majority of that followed by households. So the individual decisions that you and I make about the car that we purchase or the energy efficient appliances that we purchase is quite important to the overall global climate finance picture. Now, when we think about where do those needs come from, it's not that the finance is doesn't exist. We still see that fossil fuel investment outpaces renewable energy investment quite substantially. 
So in addition, 1.3 trillion in climate investment that we've tracked is about 1% of global GDP. So we're really seeing that it's not necessarily a, um, an impossibility to get to those climate finance needs. It's thinking about how to redirect climate finance or how to redirect finance flows and how can we really see that shifting into climate investment globally. Um, one of the other things I wanted to draw attention to was around where that finance is going. So most finance, most climate finance is concentrated in only a few regions, East Asia and Pacific, Western Europe, US and Canada. We've seen an uptick in Latin America and South Asia in particular in India and in Brazil. Um, but we're still seeing the vast majority of fi climate finance, similar to the vast majority of finance, really flow into three regions. And that's problematic because many of those other regions are growing, urbanizing, industrializing quite rapidly. And we really need to see them on a low carbon and resilient development pathway. And finally, that chart at the top shows that most climate finance is domestic. So domestic investors investing domestically whereas international climate finance is about 16% of the total. Now, the last um, data slide that I want to show is just about adaptation finance. So as I mentioned at the beginning, most of those increases in climate finance are really driven by uh, increases in mitigation, electric vehicles, renewable energy, and adaptation is increasing, but quite slowly. And actually, as a share of the total, it's going down. So in the most recent study, it's about 5% of total climate, global climate finance, or $63 billion. That's a small rectangle at the top in the middle. And as we start to see more climate impacts, of course, driving more investment and adaptation becomes more critical today for really um, for addressing vulnerabilities and, and economic impacts of, of climate change. So when we think about then how do we change um, how do we change the uh, change the trajectories and really um, move much faster at scale to deploy more investment? There's four priorities that we talk about in the latest climate finance landscape. First is around transforming the financial system, really across both public and private. One of the main things that we have been working on this year is around the reform of international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. They are uniquely positioned to take more risk, channel innovative finance and leverage concessional finance to really expand private flows in particular in developing economies. And then on the private sector side, really strengthening the um, financial sector's net zero integrity. Many have set net zero targets but we really want to see those translate into concrete action. Second, in the report, we talk about bridging climate and development needs, harnessing synergies between development and climate action makes sense. And a lot of countries are recognizing that more and more because climate change and development agendas are strongly interconnected and can deliver co-benefits for nature, public health, energy access, energy and water security, among others. Third, we really focus on mainstreaming climate adaptation uh, and resilience into, um, into, um, into financial systems and also mobilizing domestic capital. So in particular in developing economies, there's really a, um, a really an importance of using and developing local financial sectors so that they are contributing as much as possible to climate action and really uh, to both climate mitigation and adaptation. So we really want to see in particular when we talk about international financial sector reform, really see that capacity development of domestic financial institutions. And finally, fourth, really want to see more action to improve data. That's not just for our own purpose, but it's really because we, we see data as, um, as essential, essential bedrock to making improvement. The old adage, you can't manage what you don't measure. 
is absolutely true in climate finance. And so we really do want to see higher quality climate finance data being developed for, uh, for many sectors where it continues to be difficult for us to track the progress. And that's in particular true in adaptation, in forestry and land use, and in heavy industry, where although we continue to improve our methods, we still see some significant data gaps and lack of standardization, even within the public financial sector. So, um, so we're really excited about this new report. We have seen quite a lot of progress in climate finance. There's still a long ways to go. Um, and we do see that, um, that there are some, in particular, some really critical needs as evidenced on this slide for how to address those gaps. I really look forward to uh, learning more and hearing more from the many stakeholders that are watching this session to, um, to hear how you're thinking about climate finance and what questions you might have. So thank you very much. National Climate Finance Team at the Natural Resources Defense Council Joe works on international climate policy to scale up funding for developing countries, shift finance to align with uh, the Paris Agreement's goals, and reform international financial institutions to be more effective and equitable in supporting climate action. Before joining NRDC, uh, Joe worked as a climate finance associate at the World Resources Institute. He has also worked for non-governmental organizations on European Union climate and energy policy in Brussels and on UN uh, conflict prevention and disarmament policy in New York. Joe, welcome to the briefing today. You're actually an ESI briefing veteran, as Bella is as well. So uh, really looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's great to be back uh, with ESI and to be here in person this time. Last time I was doing an online presentation. Um, so I'm really pleased that Stacey was able to step in and provide some of the global context um, to, to climate finance because as, as she said, CPI does an amazing job of that. And uh, I was a bit daunted to hear this morning, oh, might have to jump in without that. But, um, but I did want to zoom in because I think a lot of the rest of the presentations today are going to focus on, on international climate finance and particularly on uh, international uh, um, uh, uh, flows from, from richer to, to poorer countries. Um, that really is at the heart of the grand bargain behind the Paris Agreement. Um, the Paris Agreement uh, essentially said, we're off track. Um, we need more climate action from everyone. Every country needs to step up and do more. But it also acknowledged that, that some countries um, don't have as much capacity to do as, as, as much. Um, and, so, uh, and, and also the poorest and most vulnerable countries who are hit first and worst have done the least to cause the crisis. So it's saying everyone needs to do more but there is a need for, for support for the for poorer countries uh, to enable them to do more. And so that really was, was at the center of the, the, the deal that was struck that enabled the Paris Agreement to get uh, passed. Um, was, 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 um, a key piece of that was the idea that uh, richer countries should provide support uh, to poorer countries uh, to enable them to step up and do more. Um, uh, one of the, the sort of totemic goals um, around that was, was the goal of mobilizing $100 billion a year um, uh, that developed countries committed to do uh, in 2009, starting in 2020. Um, they, they didn't actually meet that goal. Um, they've said that they think they will probably meet it eventually this year. Um, uh, but that, that, was, um, that was a key, um, key piece of the puzzle that, that enabled the Paris Agreement to, to, to get um, finalized. Um, and, uh, and so as part of that, the U.S. as the biggest economy in the world certainly has a, has a big role to play in, in helping meet that collective developed country goal. Um, my presentation is going to focus on, on what, what Congress uh, can do, uh, particularly with regard to, to the appropriations bills. So as I'm sure you all know, the Constitution sets out that Congress has the power of the purse. Ultimately, um, all U.S. government spending needs to be approved by Congress in, in, in one way or another. Um, there are the 12 uh, spending bills every year, the 12 appropriation bills. When it comes to international climate finance, uh, there's only really one bill to, to pay attention to, and that's the State and Foreign Operations Bill, or SFOPS. Um, so I'm going to sort of go into some of the, the key accounts to look at there um, when, when, we're, uh, when we're examining uh, international climate finance flows and the way that the, the US government 
um, can, uh, uh, can, can scale those up. Um, so the one, one way we, we sort of break it down is between climate-specific accounts and other potential sources of finance. So in terms of climate-specific accounts, these are, uh, these are lines in the budget, uh, in the appropriations bill, that are, are undeniably, undisputably beneficial to the climate. Um, and within that, there are two, two key buckets. The first one is, is uh, under Title III, bilateral economic assistance. Uh, that is funding that primarily is delivered via the US Agency for International Development, USAID, uh, also by the State Department, and some other, other agencies have role in uh, international uh, development funding delivery, but it's primarily through, through those two. And for many years, Congress has, has added three lines to, to Title III, uh, for environmental programs that, that are related to climate. Those are clean energy, adaptation, and sustainable landscapes. So clean energy, I think, is relatively self-explanatory. It includes renewable energy, energy efficiency, things like that. Uh, adaptation is, is measures that, that countries can take to, to address the impacts of climate change, um, includes uh, inc improving agricultural resilience, um, as well as some of the sort of traditional things you think about, like sea walls and, and, and stuff like that. And then sustainable landscapes relates largely to forestry finance, but also mangroves and, and ocean, ocean preservation and, and, and uh, addressing desertification, things like that. So, um, so those are the three buckets. And essentially what Congress has done is added in three lines saying, out of all the, the US government's development aid in a given fiscal year, um, we want a minimum amount to go to these three uh, areas, and they specify uh, an amount. So last year, it was 260 million for clean energy, 270 million for adaptation, and 185 million for sustainable landscapes. Those are a floor, not a ceiling. The USAID might decide that they, actually they, 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 there's more that can be done and, and they can spend more, but essentially Congress is sending a very clear message. This is the minimum amount we wanna see you spending in your bilateral aid on, on these, these three buckets of, of, of climate action. Then there are the multilateral accounts. So these are international entities that, that have been created over, over many years by the international community um, and which Congress has, has directed money to be spent on. So it includes major funds like the Green Climate Fund and the Clean Technology Fund, um, that, that some of the largest, these are multi-billion dollar funds, all the, the, the major developed countries have, have paid into these. Uh, it also includes the Global Environment Facility, uh, which actually tackles a, a variety of environmental challenges, including biodiversity, desertification, mercury pollution, but a portion of its work is also on climate. Uh, and then it includes two adaptation-specific funds, the Adaptation Fund and the Least Developed Countries Fund. Um, they 100% tackle adaptation, and the Least Developed Countries Fund, it will be no surprise to hear, only works in least developed countries. That's 47 the poorest countries in the world, um, and it supports them with their adaptation efforts. Then there's the Montreal Protocol Multilateral Fund. So the Montreal Protocol is kind of an interesting one because it was created to tackle the ozone problem um, and to deal with um, ozone depleting uh, substances. But one of, in one of those kind of, you know, we solve one problem, we create another. When ozone pollution was phased out, the substitute chemicals uh, that were often used were highly potent greenhouse gases. And I don't think people realized that at the time, but now, now they do. And so, so subsequently, the Montreal Protocol has had uh, negotiations uh, to actually phase out the replacement gases as well, uh, which, are, which these, these, are, these are greenhouse gases that are uh, tens, if not hundreds of times more powerful than, than carbon dioxide in terms of the warming effect that they have in the atmosphere. Um, so the Montreal Protocol has sort of pivoted now to, to also focus on phasing those out. And the multilateral fund provides funding to, to developing countries to help them accelerate their phase out of those gases. So that, that has a, a clear climate benefit. And then finally, the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this is the body that hosts the annual COPs and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, so the, the, the diplomatic body of the UN and the, the climate science body of the UN, uh, funding to those is also something we track. Um, so those are all the climate specific accounts. On the other side is other potential sources. And what we mean here is, is um, entities that the, the uh, Appropriations Bill funds, but doesn't specify that these are climate specific. So the core, the Development Finance Corporation, the Export Import Bank, all of these uh, entities 
get, get funding approved, get their core budgets approved by the US government. They often actually operate at no net cost to the taxpayer because they operate through reflows and through interest on, on the, the guarantees and loan products that they offer. Um, but they do get their core budget approved by Congress. But Congress isn't saying you need to work on climate, but increasingly these institutions are. And they're doing that for, for two reasons. One is that the um, uh, that, that some of them, the, those agencies are setting specific targets. So the Development Finance Corporation has a target that 33% of all of its um, activities, all of its finance uh, starting this year will go towards, uh, to, towards climate objectives. Um, but they're also, the, particularly DFC and Export Import Bank, are demand driven. They respond to the needs of the private sector. So when US exporters come to them and say, hey, we, we, want, export, uh, we want export credit assistance to, um, uh, to help our clean energy business to export to, to other countries, um, Export Import Bank, DFC, respond to that. And as, as you know, the US is, is, is moving, particularly with the Inflation Reduction Act, to try and become a, a clean energy superpower um, and to export some of that around the world. And so there can be a win-win there in terms of uh, this is helping US companies, but it's also helping other countries to roll out their clean energy and their, their resilience technologies. Um, and so that, that is, is these agencies are responding to that demand and, and scaling up their climate finance accordingly. So Congress isn't saying the, you need to do this much climate finance compared to like the bilateral accounts where it's very clear this is the minimum. But when they approve these agencies' budgets and these agencies are operating um, as, as they do, they're, they're increasingly dedicating more of their finance flows towards climate objectives. Um, I think that's a very good thing. Um, but it's hard to say uh, ex ante, it's hard to say up front when the appropriations bill passes each year, how much ultimately will end up going from these agencies to climate finance. And then there are the multilateral development banks. And I'm not going to go into too much detail there because I know Valerie is going to speak on that next. But these are, these are international institutions, all the world's governments, um, uh, or almost all the world's governments are shareholders in them. And they too have increasingly been doing more and more uh, climate financing. And the percentages you see after each of the bank is the US voting power which roughly equates to their shareholding in these institutions. So again here, the US has a big influence on them. Uh, they're often the largest shareholder. Um, and that means that the, the US is, um, uh, can, one, can claim credit for some of the, the, the climate finance that they provide, um, but also can help encourage them to do more on climate um, if, if they want to. So, um, so that's, um, that's the other, the, the, the final piece to, to look at. What does this all mean when we start to put some numbers on it? This, shows, uh, this graph shows the last few years of appropriations bills um, and the climate-specific accounts. Um, so it shows fiscal 21, the enacted bill, fiscal 22 and 23, the enacted bills. And then for 24, as you all know, the, um, the, that's currently being negotiated. Um, so we, instead, we, we're showing what the House and the Senate have put in. I think the key thing that stands out here is that the the president budget request, um, as, as, as on most uh, lines, is, is a lot higher than what Congress ultimately approves. Uh, the last few years, Congress has, a, has a, approved a billion dollars in climate-specific account funding. Um, the, um, the majority of what's been approved has been those bilateral programs in the light blue, but they've also approved funding for the Clean Technology Fund and the Global Environment Facility, and as well as the Montreal Protocol and the UNFCCC and IPCC. Um, the Green Climate Fund has been something that, that the administration has requested. Congress has never directly approved money for the GCF, but they have approved money for flexible accounts, and the administration has used that to make some payments to the GCF. Um, so I think the sort of key takeaway here is that, that one, that the, the, what Congress has been appropriating is certainly not matching what the president has, um, has been doing. But these are the climate-specific accounts, and although when the bill passes, we can say with certainty that a billion dollars from the US will be going to international climate. That is not the end of the story. If we go back, the bilateral development finance agencies are all doing uh, increasingly more on climate finance. Last year, the DFC did $2.3 billion in, in, uh, in, in climate finance. Exxon did $176 million. Uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation hasn't reported yet, but in previous years, they've done an average of 250 million a year. So I'd say about 3 billion from those three agencies alone, on top of the 1 billion in climate specific. And they are increasing. 
So DFC has this 33% goal, and they've recently announced that in, 20, in fiscal year 23, they did $9 billion in climate finance. Uh, so essentially $3 billion we can expect, will, uh, sorry, $9 billion in total finance, which means $3 billion we can expect to be climate finance. Um, so I think those are really important to look at. Again, you know, Congress does approves their core budget, can, can exercise oversight and can, can encourage them to do more on climate, but they don't have to specifically direct it. The same goes for the MDBs, and I know Valerie will get into that. But I think that that's, that's a key piece, is that when you hear the president pledging $11 billion a year in US climate finance, uh, and then you see only $1 billion was appropriated, it's certainly disappointing. It would be good to see more. But it's important to remember that there are other agencies that will be, that will be providing more climate finance, and we'll see the reporting filter through in subsequent years. And so even if it's, it's difficult to get more through the actual appropriations bill in terms of climate-specific financing, there are these other channels, there are these other levers that can be used. Happy to get into a lot more detail on that uh, later, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was great. And you mentioned our next speaker a couple times um, and uh, uh, really looking forward to uh, Valerie's presentation as well. Valerie's Lack uh, Valerie Laxton is a senior associate in the World Resources Institute's Finance Center, where she leads the center's work to promote climate ambition at development finance institutions, including multilateral development banks, national development banks, and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, before joining WRI, she was working at the International Finance Corporation, a member of the World Bank Group, as a sector economist. She started her career at the EU and headed to the Economic and Financial Affairs section at the delegation of the European Union to the United States here in Washington, D.C. Valerie, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. Um, thanks for the introduction. So what I'm going to do is to zoom into one of the channels of international public finance that Joe has mentioned, the multilateral development banks, and why are multilateral development banks even discussed um, today? Why now? Um, well, just a few words about back when it all started. What are these multilateral development banks? Well, they were first envisioned after World War II to help um, finance the rebuilding after the war uh, of these war-torn countries. And over the 20th century, their mission shifted from reconstruction to economic development and poverty eradication. And in addition, today, that actually means addressing urgent challenges, which are shaped by persistent development challenges on the one hand, and exacerbated by climate change and the impact thereof. So MDBs are part of a complex but fragmented global financial system, and they were not designed initially to tackle these from the get-go. Um, MDBs are major providers of public climate finance, um, essentially, and especially to developing countries, uh, those countries that need it most. And momentum has built quite a bit since, since the, um, the, the last year uh, to reform these MDBs such that they can address the multiple challenges um, that these countries face even better. And what does it mean? Well, that debate started in the autumn of last year. It took up um, speed in the annual meetings of the World Bank Group um, in autumn of last year. Then it was picked up again in Paris in the June summit at the um, summit on the Global Financial Pact. Um, and it will certainly continue to pick up speed. We, uh, we saw some discussions and follow-up discussions at the World Bank's annual meetings um, earlier this month. So the idea of that reform is really to keep, keep what works and to build on these capabilities to deliver at scale and speed for those countries. Um, so MDBs today, which are they? I'll put up all the logos on this slide. Um, so there's the World Bank Group, um, the European Investment Bank, the ADB, uh, Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, et cetera. Um, the World Bank, and especially at the beginning, it was called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It, cre it was created in 1944, and it's the largest, with 190, almost 190 members. It lends to governments um, and to private um, firms. So it lends to governments through IBRD, through the um, 
um, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and to the lowest uh, income countries through IDAP. Um, and the IFC was established in 1955, uh, through which it lends to private funds. And other banks, all the other uh, banks on, that you see on this, uh, on this slide, are somewhat smaller and more regional. Some have more regional focus. They help bridge knowledge gaps, expertise gaps, and of course, the financing gaps that exist in countries to finance their development. Um, MDBs are part of the global financial system and they traditionally provide finance for economic development and increasingly so for climate finance, the way we've talked about it today. Um, so for example, they can support countries who want to work with them to make the investments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect their people against the impact of climate change. These are the two pillars that we talked about for mitigation and adaptation activities. And in 2022, MDBs have committed about 60 million to low and middle income countries and 38 billion to um, in high income countries. It's about 43% of their total commitments that were specifically intended for climate finance purposes. MDBs bring part of the solution um, to finance gim financing gaps, but they're not the only ones. And you've um, seen from the spaghetti chart of CPI that there are a number of sources that, um, that can also um, provide finance for um, plugging these gaps, bilateral development partners, other international financial institutions, private financial institutions, philanthropies, et cetera. So how do um, MDBs provide climate finance? Well, they can use different types of financing that I've put up on this slide. Um, they, um, they use different instruments, different financing instruments. Um, climate finance provides both for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and investing in ad adapting activities to make them more resilient. And that is done through a range of possible financing options um, to invest in low carbon resilient solutions. These are loans primarily, but also policy-based financing and few grants. MDBs use a range of approaches to mitigate different types of risks and to mobilize private capital. And that is definitely something that has been pushed higher up on the agenda in the past year. So what's included in such type of financing? Some examples of mitigation finance um, include support to provide clean energy, improve energy access in the transport sector, for example, uh, investment in clean urban transport, um, improvements to buildings and public infrastructure and their energy efficiencies. That's all uh, in the mitigation bucket, so to speak. Examples of adaptation finance include improvements to wastewater systems, improvements to um, crop and food production, such, that, such as to minimize losses down the line, um, improvements in terms of coastal infrastructure to reduce the loss um, when uh, coastal in infrastructure is damaged and when disasters hit. So investments need to be, um, to be um, made up front to, to reduce the impact of, of those losses. Adaptation finance that second bucket is particularly important in small island states and in least developed countries. And this chart shows the um, share of total climate finance to developing countries that goes to those two groups of countries, the least developed economies and the small island developing states. And it's really critical that this type of finance for adaptation goes to these countries and continues to grow because um, they are countries that are extremely vulnerable to the impact of climate change, to extreme weather events, and to um, the impact of slow onset um, shocks like sea level rises, et cetera. And they are the countries that also have very limited capacity for climate action to invest in adaptation measures um, from, uh, from their own perspective. Um, the big gaps between um, the needs of these countries and the available resources is why we are all here talking about this today. Um, we have to acknowledge that there are gaps in finance and investment, um, but there's capital globally that exists but isn't really channeled necessarily to those purposes. And currently, um, there are estimates about these gaps. Um, the current global finance, um, uh, um, global climate finance accounts for around 30% of what's needed to align with the two degrees or 
uh, preferably 1.5 degree um, trajectories um, from the UNFCCC. Um, adaptation for developing countries is about five to 10 times below the estimated needs. And our own research at WRI estimates that public and private investments will need to increase more than 10 times faster by 2030 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and adapt to intensifying impacts of climate change. Overall, the long-term long financing for development of developing countries' needs is at least $500 billion per year, and that's the estimate from the UN's um, recent uh, Finance for Sustainable Development report. Um, why MDBs? Well, MDBs can finance climate and development together. Um, they have relevant expertise and knowledge about sectors and countries that is pretty specific, and they have a years of experience dealing with the countries. They have presence on the ground with um, relationships with the public and private sectors in the countries. They know um, and have an, uh, a good handle over local challenges for that reason. They can support infrastructure investment, but also support strengthening of institutions and policies or uh, improve capacity building or provide capacity building in countries. That is a very important function. <clears throat> they have... Um, multiple financial tools like loans, budget support, project financing, guarantees that they can mobilize to support countries in their climate finance. Um, they include grants or other highly concessional forms of finance, which are very sought after, but rare. So um, they're very, um, very important to a number of uh, least developed countries um, in that respect. They're well positioned to lead um, the transition to low carbon and resilient economies. Um, they've jointly committed to working together on Paris alignment to um, achieve the, um, the international community's Paris goals. Um, they have experience with methodologies to deliver um, on, uh, on outcomes and impact and to assess and monitor those impacts through different ways that they have uh, harmonized methodologies to work together on these issues. And they have a specific financial model where paid in capital contributions from shareholders are small in relation to volumes of additional lending capacity that they have leveraged in the past and they continue to leverage. So as, as, um, as we implement the, these reforms um, um, and, uh, and MDBs lead the, yeah, the reforms that they have been asked to, uh, to, to go through, um, they're pretty um, well positioned to, uh, to support the transitions in countries. Um, how can they contribute more to deliver on climate and development objectives? And what have um, world leaders asked of them? And what do we um, hear from the world leaders, and notably the group of 20, um, that they would uh, require for these, um, these multilateral institutions to deliver at speed and more with more scale? When well, the G20, the group of 20, they mandated an independent experts group that um, lays out a triple agenda for these institutions to contribute to bridge these gaps. And um, it would take, according to that expert group, it would take um, MDB's missions and mandates that add global challenges to poverty and shared prosperity goals that they already have. And the World Bank has just agreed to update its mission uh, at the annual meetings in October to end poverty on a livable planet, and that's a step forward. Um, they also, that group also indicated that a tripling of annual MDB finance was needed by 2030. And having new investors partner to expand MDB lending capacity, including the private sector, would be very important. Um, to help support countries' strategies when it comes to development and climate investments, MDBs can support countries in formulating and financing their strategies for low carbon and resilient developments. They can share data and knowledge and provide technical assistance. They can prioritize interventions that align with the development and climate goals, and they can focus on outcomes and impact. They can also increasingly um, work as a coherent system and in partnerships such that um, they all deliver. Um, to, uh, to improve the processes and the ways they work together to deliver more for countries. For that, they need to remain well-resourced, um, should be allowed to take more risk, and um, should really um, partner together um, so that all of the above um, interventions can be and continue to be um, 
a, uh, a source of uh, valuable climate finance for the lowest income countries and, uh, and deliver what's needed to address their, their challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valerie, for your presentation. Um, just wanted to make two quick reminders or share two quick reminders. One is um, the slides from all of our panelists, including Bella, who's not with us today. All of our slides are posted online at www.esi.org. There are also printed copies out on the front table if you want to get them. There's some really great stuff in these slides, and I'm sure folks will want to go back. If you want to go back and revisit any individual presentations or the whole briefing, uh, there'll be a webcast posted um, on the briefing page, and you're welcome to do that as well. Um, and lastly, um, we're talking about a lot of pretty heavy topics today, a lot of complicated topics, and that means uh, we might have a really robust Q&A today. I hope we do. For folks in the audience, we'll have a microphone so you can ask questions of our panelists. And for folks online, you can send us an email at a, uh, ask, that's ASK, at EESI.org, uh, or follow us on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, uh, at EESI online, and get your questions into us that way. I've already fully introduced Stacy once before, so I won't do it again, but I would like to welcome Stacy Swan with Climate Finance Advisors once again up to the lectern. Thank you, Stacy. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna start with um, a slide that I always think is useful kind of before you get into the conversation about how to talk about financing solutions for climate change. Um, I pulled this yesterday from NOAA's website. Um, this, is the, um, this is the September temperature anomaly, uh, and it shows also kind of a historical graphic of um, uh, average temperatures, um, global land and ocean average temperatures. Obviously, September was, um, was, was pretty out there in terms of kind of the, the trends. Um, we don't know if October is going to be out there in, the tr in terms of the trends. And, just to kind of note a couple of things, this is raw data that comes from um, temperature gauges, um, both air, land, and ocean. This is just counting kind of warmth um, in those three um, areas. This has nothing that's not been interpreted in any other way. Um, so what we don't know is whether, you know, this one month is going to come back down or kind of where this is going to go, whether this is a trend or not. This is one month's um, set of data. But if you drew a trend line, uh, through this, you will see a sloping curve that is going up. Um, so we um, know in the science community that we're locking in a certain amount of warming um, over the baseline of um, uh, of the 20th, 20th century average. And that warming is going to have impacts, um, physical impacts on uh, different types of systems that we all depend on. And those impacts are going to have financial consequences and economic consequences. Um, that's just a level set to kind of you know, bring the climate part of climate finance back into the conversation. Um, you can go into the NOAA website and look at a lot of this data. Actually, the way they've improved um, the collection of uh, warming data over the last five years is amazing. So it's there, and it's there for anyone to kind of see. Um, but that means there's a lot of climate risk on the horizon. Actually, climate risk is here today. Uh, one of the things that's changed since I've worked on climate change in 25 years is that it's no longer far off in the future. We're experiencing these impacts today. Hurricane Otis yesterday, if anyone saw that headline, it was kind of buried uh, in a lot of our news. But the most rapidly intensifying storm ever um, to hit the, um, uh, the North American coastline. Um, we have locked in warming. The warming is changing our climate system. Those changes are having effects. Um, those effects have economic and financial consequences. Um, and that is really uh, one of the drivers of why this becomes an issue that's not just a public policy issue, but it is an all, all of the above issue, including kind of finance, private sector, um, and consumers. The warming that we've locked in has acute and chronic impacts. Um, acute impacts is Hurricane Otis. Chronic impacts are things like uh, where water is becoming more scarce or too much, uh, where droughts are occurring, um, too much water, too little water, too much heat, um, storms that are changing um, the way tributaries operate. Um, also kind of one of the chronic impacts from climate change, from a changing climate system, where we grow food, um, which is going to be a very important issue, particularly internationally. Um, and food grows across state boundaries. So back to some of the 
the um, points about the international climate finance channels, particularly the multilateral development banks, the bilateral development banks, national development banks. Some of these things are um, in places where agriculture is a big driver of GDP. There's chronic impacts that are going to be happening because of the um, changing in the climate a change of the climate system. And those um, financial impacts affect kind of businesses. They affect those the, those businesses and uh, investors. And they affect kind of um, the sources of where finance um, comes from. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, obviously, there's also security and migration issues and um, issues around social stability, which has, um, you know, implications beyond just international development. Um, you know, one of the, um, uh, in 2014, the, the um, Defense Department here in the United States put out its first report on climate change and called climate change a threat multiplier. And we're seeing that over the last decade in terms of an increased kind of social instability. Um, this obviously has effects on, on communities, but the most vulnerable um, are affected kind of um, the greatest. Um, but also in the context of this conversation, it puts pressures on governments, but the government's balance sheets as well, which is a source of capital and a source of capital that's really important to talk about climate finance and climate investment. Um, it also has issues in terms of econo economies, in terms of capital flight, um, where, where people choose to live or not live, where economic development um, uh, grows or doesn't grow, um, and then obviously the kind of financial consequences to all of the businesses and communities and people there. Um, this means that today, uh, in 2023, um, we have increased pressure to transition to a low carbon net zero world faster um, because climate change is happening faster. Um, and it's already here today. It's not far off in the future. It's not 2050. Um, it's actually starting to show up now. Um, it also necessitates that we invest in uh, climate-related resilience, um, which is um, sometimes called adaptation, but it's adaptation and resilience. And this is both physical resilience to certain types of climate impacts that will happen, and also economic resilience to certain types of climate impacts that will happen. When you think about transition risk, which is a risk of transitioning to the low carbon economy, there are some economic implications uh, for certain communities and workers um, and jobs. Um, and those aren't just questions here in the United States, they're actually questions internationally as well. If you think about how some developing countries, um, GDP is weighted on certain types of fossil industries, there's some big transition risk questions that need to be addressed and need to be addressed in a way that's just and equitable. Um, this can all be kind of doom and gloom, kind of from an investment perspective or a policy perspective or an international development perspective. But actually, it turns out to be the most important um, investment opportunity of a generation. Um, it also happens to be the only investment opportunity um, that has a positive ROI at, for the largest number of people in the greatest number of places. Um, investing in climate solutions, um, both the transition and the resilience, is actually going to be net positive not just for people and not just for economies, but also for financing, because climate change has a lot of financial risks. Um, and we're already starting to see that um, show up. I wanted to make um, another um, comment that I tend to do uh, when I talk about climate finance um, and why finance is important for climate. But there's been a lot of discussion here in this country, at least for the last two years, around ESG. ESG is a really big term that encompasses a lot of things, but ESG risk historically has been meant, at least the E part, has been more environmental risk. And environmental risk is very important, but it's not climate risk. They overlap and they're connected, but the distinction is um, think about a project or a company or an asset and think about what they do to the environment, how they pollute the water or pollute the air or uh, destruct habitats, that's environmental risk. Climate risk and climate-related financial risk is really what the changing climate is going to do to an asset. So these are both sides of a coin. They're very much connected, but they're really distinct. So very important to think about that when you're thinking about investment, because they have very different materiality issues and points. Um, environmental risk under ESG, um, has social and environmental materiality, which tends to have some reputational risk, but in terms of how it affects an organization, 
the reputational risk may have financial consequences in terms of damages paid or being sued, right? Um, climate risk actually can um, reduce revenues. It can increase costs. It can change asset values. So if you're a company or you're an investor and you're thinking about uh, a construction project and that construction project needs to be profitable so you can pay your employees and make a uh, return for your investors, and that climate risk that exists for that project means costs are going up so that you're no longer profitable. That's climate-related financial risk. So climate risk is what the climate does to a project and how that can affect financially the returns of a project. Um, environmental risk tends to be the, the other side of the coin, how a project can affect the environment. Now, for those of you who work on climate change, the one big part of the Venn diagram there is around emissions. Emissions is a project, a, something an entity does to the environment, but they come back full circle when the climate gets warmer and starts to have greater impacts on an asset. Um, but again, lots of opportunities to invest in mitigation and adaptation here. Um, and this is really, really important because if we fix this, um, we're doing, a, a, we're, we're really fixing kind of the financial, long-term financial sustainability of the assets that we're investing in. Um, so. so how we make our investments matter. We talked about, in the, in the beginning, we talked about the CPI spaghetti diagram, and um, Joe and Valerie have also talked about kind of both public dollars that the U.S. Uh, government gives to international climate finance, and Valerie talked about some of the channels um, the, the multilateral development banks, some of the U.S. organizations um, that actually take that money and put it out into the world in different types of forms. Um, how we actually make our investments is going to be really, really important because the cost of climate risk may undermine the performance of all of our um, investments and assets, both public and private. So what does that mean if you're a holder of the public balance sheet? Actually, the most kind of sustainable fiduciary, uh, responsible perspective from a fiduciary perspective and a financial return perspective is the one that runs through um, investing in something that is going to reduce financial risks to maximize returns. From the public balance sheet, um, that means finan financial returns is both kind of preserving the capital, but also the impacts and the public goods that the, pu the public balance sheet wants to invest in. Um, oh my gosh, okay. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are, international, domestic, uh, the public balance sheet alone is insufficient to fund climate change. So just if you recall, kind of the spaghetti diagram that CPI does, the one that's on the website is about a year old. They will update it very soon, probably before COP. Um, I recall the number 650 something trillion dollar, a billion dollars. Um, the needs for investing in climate related um, mitigation and resilience, the energy transition and the adaptation resilient investments, all those estimates start with a T. And it doesn't matter whether you're slicing it for emerging markets or for the US alone or for certain regions, the amount of money needed to address the energy transition and to address adaptation and resilience is so much more than the funds that are flowing right now to climate change. That this is really about how to take some of the really important catalytic capital, which public dollars are, to unlock the private investment. And that's what um, the CPI diagram was showing a little bit when they were showing kind of uh, some of the, the sources, the instruments, and the uses but also what the MDBs are good at and what a lot of public institutions are good at. Um, so private investors, financial institutions play an incredibly pivotal role in scaling up and directing finance. Um, and one of the ways they can kind of uh, pull these things together, I'm gonna give you an example, it's in the slides. I don't have much time to go through this, but we can, happy to answer questions. But one of the ways they could do this is through blended finance. Um, uh, prior to starting Climate Finance Advisors, I was at IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank, and was the person who set up and then ran IFC's blended finance department. Blended finance is really about taking this, the patient public sources of capital and structuring it to leverage and mobilize private capital for things that might have um, a low carbon, climate resilient outcome. Uh, the blended finance work of IFC was primarily climate in the early days. Now they do blended finance in a lot of different ways. But in a very simple kind of uh, way to think about this, money in, money out, 
the money inside of a lot of what uh, blended finance funds and vehicles and institutions do is really sourced from public balance sheets. So when Valerie was talking about the multilateral development banks, they channel a lot of these public dollars that are then leveraged. So one public dollar to X amount of private investment to invest in something that is climate resilient or climate uh, part of the low carbon transition. That is how we are going to get from the $650 billion dollars today to the trillions of dollars that we need um, to address climate change. And that model can be replicated internationally, it's already being done, but also domestically at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. One of the things that's happening here in the United States that's really interesting is the movement around green and resilience banks. I made this little example around resilience, but a lot of examples around green banks, which are exactly this um, approach. And I will stop there. Thank you very, very much, Stacey. Um, and if anyone would like to go back to slides, of course, they're all available online. I know CPI doesn't need my advice on anything, but I do have an observation. I don't think it looks like spaghetti. It reminds me more of Play-Doh. Like, it reminds me of, like, something you might, like, shoot through. I don't know. I, don't, I know that's how spaghetti is made, but I feel like that's more of a spaghetti thing. So I'll bring that up with Bella when she's feeling better. Um, that brings us to our, our fourth panelist today, Elizabeth Lean. Elizabeth has more than 15 years of experience working in climate finance, development policy, international macro and macroeconomic analysis, and gender policy. Uh, Jennifer, Elizabeth oversees the America is All In Coalition for the World Wildlife Fund U.S. Uh, this coalition represents over 5,000 organizations, half of the U.S. population, and represents all 50 states. She also leads on federal climate policy work for WWF US and engages international partners to maximize climate impact. In her previous role as senior advisor for international climate finance at the Treasury's newly created Climate Hub, she coordinated and elevated international climate issues Treasury wide. Uh, she has experience representing the US government in international negotiations and meetings, and now she is an ESI panelist. So, Elizabeth, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I like that addition to the to the list. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm really lucky to go after these three wonderful panelists because I'm just going to draw on everything they said and, uh, and, and go with that. All right, starting the timer. So um, one thing that I think would be useful at this point is to think about everything that each of these panelists have talked about how that relates to the US government, how that relates to the executive branch, the legislative branch, and then what that means going into COP. COP28 is sort of this big climate moment. It doesn't mean that we're going to solve something enormous in Dubai on December X. What it means is that you're gonna have really smart people excited about making progress on this issue come together and try to make, you know, continue to make progress. These are the thematic days that the COP presidency, so that is the, the government of the United Arab Emirates, um, developed in partnership, of course, with the UN. Um, and what you see among all of these is that although there is a dedicated finance day, finance comes up in every single one of these topics. It is absolutely critical that in the multi-level action urbanization issue that you consider how are you going to finance you know, cities? How are you going to finance states? Um, another interesting thing this year is there is this local climate action summit that is going that is being developed right now um, with the UAE and Bloomberg Philanthropies to highlight the importance of subnational action. So you have, of course, the federal government. They're making as much progress as possible. These various governments come together to try to negotiate various things. But ultimately, if the cities can't implement the, the building codes that actually have impact if you can't get the states to you know, offer tax credits that coupled with federal tax credits actually make progress, you're not going to have the same kind of action. So that's um, one of the things that's different. I am going to double down on the just transition um, day in a little bit. But as you can see, um, really, finance comes up in every single one of them. One of the things, so these are, these are um, sort of three buckets that, um, at least in my mind, I, I think of when I think of the U.S. government's participation at COP and how they 
think about their work um, and, and where to make progress on climate finance. The first is really focused on public sector programs. This is very much in line with what Joe talked about. You have bilateral programs, the Green Climate Fund, the Loss and Damage Fund will make progress. It will not be capitalized at this COP. This is a longer term play. Um, and then there is an increasing focus on nature finance. Um, the interplay between nature finance and climate finance is, is becoming more important. Um, and you are seeing and hearing a lot more from private firms, public sector officials, the importance of making sure that when you think about climate finance, you are also considering nature. The middle category is actually one that um, I think is really interesting. What you will hear and see um, leading up to and throughout COP28 is the discussion of how do we focus private sector efforts or um, other government efforts or subnational efforts in a way that is consistent with the climate agenda. So there will be a number of bank CEOs wandering the halls of COP. They will be highlighting all of their, the work that they're trying to do on, on climate change behind the scenes. What you will also see is that the US government, other government, European governments, other partners will be talking to them and encouraging them to do more. The Energy Transition Accelerator is this kind of um, new concept that was launched last COP by um, the State Department and other um, non-federal partners to think through how to do carbon credits in the energy sector in a way that is um, sort of strong and defensible. That is still very much in development. And then there's this question of whether we can agree as you know, civil society, as broader partners, on how to do fossil phase out and fossil phase down. Um, the multi-party action is this third category. That's where you think about um, the $100 billion goal, which was referenced earlier. So far, donor governments have not met that goal. They will claim that they're, this is the year that they're going to meet, um, meet the goal, probably um, at this COP. And then, of course, there's the MDB evolution and climate finance agenda that, that Valerie talked about. This is an example that I kind of wanted to walk through because there are so many moving pieces. Any of you who work on appropriations know very well, as Joe mentioned, the state foreign ops bill is the one that really highlights, um, does a lot of work on climate finance. But it is not the only one. So when you think about how the US government could make progress in a certain area, one area where the USG leaned in two cops ago was um, uh, in Glasgow. These are the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. So the very first of its kind was this agreement where the US government in partnership with the UK and other donors got together with the South African government and said, how far can you go by getting out of coal? If we put money on the table um, in a significant way, will you commit to transitioning away from coal and investing in the renewable energy future? South Africa's coal facilities, for any of you who know, are crumbling. And so this was really an opportunity for them to invest in a renewable energy future that would be much more sustainable than the existing energy facilities that are there. But what did that mean for the USG, just as one donor partner? You can see support from Department of Energy. They have the labs that can help doing the analysis, leaning on an international partner like the IEA. There's technical assistance. All of that is sort of bucketed in this analysis bucket. That then leads to, OK, what are the policy reforms that you need to, to see in order to actually justify this big investment? We're not just going to put money on the table without some sort of give on the other side. Those policy reforms can come by you know, asking the, the World Bank or the African Development Bank to really lean in and try to get um, the South African government to commit to some changes in how they regulate energy, how they um, structure some of their um, power purchase agreements, lots of different things that, that they can think through of, of how to get those policy reforms going. The coal retirement piece is really messy, and it is really uncomfortable, both for governments and for the private sector. But luckily, there is this core group of governments and private sector partners who are willing to think creatively about how to do it. What kind of slice of concessional finance can we add to this private financing mix to be able to refinance this coal facility so that we shave off 10 years of its life. Those, those are the types of questions and conversations that are happening in South Africa, in Indonesia, 
in Vietnam um, as these just energy transition partnerships continue? And then ultimately, how are the energy systems going to be financed? The answer in large part on the end here should be the private sector. Most, when you think about you know, these large emerging markets, G20 countries, it should be the private sector that is able to finance a solar array that is, you know, um, that you can plug into the energy system or, or um, some of the hydro facilities. What gets a little bit difficult is when it's off grid, a smaller market, or um, um, if there are some other complexities, right? But the other big thing that I wanted to add down here, there is an expectation that each of these countries are going to put some skin in the game, and that includes domestic resources. So that needs to come from a lot of these countries and um, to make sure that they are actually investing in their, in their own future. OK. Finally, I wanted to, to end on nature finance. This was something that I just kind of brushed past earlier on, but it is something that I think is worth mentioning. So there are, um, as I said, there are, there are increasing focus on nature-based solutions, how to finance nature in a way that is consistent with the climate agenda and vice versa. Um, there are different opportunities to think about or, or models to think about. One is this project for permanence that WWF um, thinks about a lot. Um, and th these are all sort of different ways to make sure that you are protecting nature by conserving forests or conserving other types of nature. Um, I think I'm going to wrap there and just see if there are questions in there. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a great way to bring all of the presentations together. Um, I'm going to, I'll keep that up. Um, all right. Well, as Elizabeth uh, insinuated, now we will get in time for questions. But since Elizabeth ended her presentation on uh, nature and natural finance, natural climate solutions finance. I wanted to mention that one of the things we'll be up to during that first week is we'll be part of ESI will be part of a UNFCCC side event about natural climate solutions, and so that'll be something that we cover in our daily newsletter, COP Dispatch. So if you haven't already subscribed to COP Dispatch, it'll come out every day. Time to be late afternoon East Coast, and it'll be sort of a survey of events from a congressional perspective. A lot of emphasis on US and natural climate solutions is something that we've specifically emphasized uh, over the last two years um, as something that's of interest to this audience, but also is gaining in prominence. Um, also, um, um, uh, if you, uh, we'll, we'll also be coming back to um, some of these topics in, in upcoming um, uh, briefings as well. So that gets us to Q&A. I have a whole bunch of questions that I have preloaded and am prepared to ask but I would love to defer to members of our in-person audience. And so if you have a question and you can catch my eye before I start reading from my sheet of paper, you'll get to go first. And my friend Maggie, or Maggie? Yeah, Maggie is gonna be our, our microphone wrangler today. She's one of our policy interns. So if you raise your hand before I can start reading, I'll come to you. Oh, Maggie, right next to you. And then we'll go back to you for sure. Um, hi, I'm Sophia. I am a legislative analyst for uh... Senator Whitehouse, um, I've been reading the news about um, how folks are um, unhappy with the World Bank for the Green Climate Fund. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what to do with um, the disagreement there. Thank you. Um, any panelist is welcome to, to jump in on that if you would like. Can you say more unhappy how? Hello. Oh, so uh, the less developed countries are upset with the World Bank because uh, it historically has not treated them very well. Uh, that, that's my understanding from reading brief news. <laughs> Am I saying this correctly? Did I, did I yeah, understand? Yeah, it's a really long, long, long answer. I don't know. If you want. <laughs> I mean, um, and and there, yeah, I, it, there's a there's a whole course on like why the history of that. Um, yeah, I guess I, I can start and um, and just say that there's a long history to the World Bank and its intervention in the world. And as I said, it, it, started, it all started um, when it was about reconstructing and then the mission has shifted. And one of the, um, one of its core missions is to um, eliminate poverty uh, and ensure prosperity. 
and in it and that is arguably it's um and it it's been its core mission ever ever since and now the um, one of the debates is um how to address both economic development and climate change or the impact of climate change together without jeopardizing um the uh the uh, resources that are allocated to eliminate to alleviating poverty. So this is really the um, part of the debate right now coming from developing countries um, and the bank has to ensure that it um, actually fights poverty and continues on its core mission and its core mandate and also addresses the impact of climate change, which um, I should say that both are intertwined um, in many, uh, many respects when um, countries have to um, um, to invest in both adaptation to climate change because that will help alleviate um, poverty and sources of poverty in the countries as well. So all of these um, these uh, challenges are somewhat intertwined, but that is one part of the big, uh, bigger picture issue. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. So I think one of the other reasons this is coming up, uh, particularly this week, and maybe this is what you've uh, you've been reading about, is the negotiations on creating the loss and damage fund and um, there's been a push from some developed countries particularly to have the loss and damage fund hosted within the world bank and there's been a really vigorous debate on whether the world bank is the best suited institution to host that um, the least developed countries particularly i think have been pushing back because um, as valerie showed that the world bank um, hasn't hasn't done as much for for the, the poorest and most vulnerable countries as, as, as for a lot of the middle-income countries. Um, and then I think there's the question around like the World Bank's financial instruments. So that it's largely loan-based, whereas a lot of the loss and damage discussion is around grant finance. Um, so I think there's there's been a lot of debate around uh, is, is the World Bank the best uh, host for that fund? Um, and I think it's important to distinguish between the trusteeship and the host um, so the World Bank is essentially the host of every single multilateral climate, uh, sorry, the trustee for every single multilateral climate fund, um, because they're one of the few entities that actually can provide those kind of trusteeship services. Um, but then actually having them as the host of the fund is, is a different and a bigger uh, lift. And, and so there's a lot of discussion around that, um, whether there's... I think one of the challenges is that the, the the obvious question is well who else would be good to do it who else um, that one one option is to create a standalone entity but that will take many years to get set up the green climate fund took several years to get established it was created in 2010 it didn't start approving projects until 2015 um, and there's a lot of desire to have the loss and damage fund get going much quicker than that um, so I think that's one piece of it. Um, th you know, there's been discussion of like whether some of the UN agencies might be able to take on that role. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of factors going into this specific debate about the loss and damage facility. And then there's obviously all the broader broader issues around the World Bank as well. Great, thanks. On the GCF side, I don't know if that's another one that you wanted um, answered. I think that one is is sort of more difficult. GCF is still a very young fund, as Joe mentioned. I mean, it was created um, not long ago. It only started developing projects and implementing those projects through its accredited entities not long ago. Um, it doesn't really um, meet absolutely everyone's needs. Um, I was the first GCF desk officer at the Treasury Department and sort of lived through the negotiations of thinking about how do you develop something that is better at making sure that developing countries have a voice because the shareholder system at the multilateral development banks has been one where some developing countries don't like this sort of that system. I will say the United States government does like that system because they do have sort of a, a stronger voice at, at those boards. So the GCF is still sort of um, working through how to get money out the door quickly, how to make sure that it's working through um, entities at the country level, so these, these direct access facilities to make sure that resources go through, um, you know, the Rwandan development <laughs> entity, for instance, um, and not just through the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the larger banks. So um, that's another one where, you know, over a cocktail we could probably get into much more Cocktails. Detail. Wow. It's only not even 3.30. But, hey, um, why not? Elizabeth? I like your style. Um, we actually had an online question come in that was very similar to that. So if you're in our online audience and you asked a very similar question that and you also work for a U.S. senator, I hope you'll accept that as an answer. 
I forgot when I mentioned Cop Dispatch to introduce my friend Laura. Laura is our other policy intern, and she has a sign-in sheet, and she's going to send it around, starting with the person sitting next to her. If you would like to sign up for Cop Dispatch, if you haven't yet, this is a great opportunity to do that, and we'll be sure to add you to the list. We have a strict privacy policy. If you sign up for one newsletter, that doesn't mean you sign up for all of them, although I encourage that as well. So thank you, Laura. Sorry for forgetting you a little bit ago. Um, we had a question in the back there, and um, we will hear from you next. And if you have any other questions, we'll do as many. We'll do our best to get to as many as possible. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Sharon with the House Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. We actually have a Seek Ocean, Nature and Oceans Task Force focused on nature-based climate solutions. So Elizabeth, you ended on the best note. And I wanted to learn more about what are the ways in which we're funding nature-based climate solutions through international finance. Thanks. Um, I will say that the US government is, is, there are some core programs, some of them Joe outlined, you know, when you think about some of the forestry funds, um, there are some, some programs that do that work. Bilateral entities are doing that work. Um, but in my humble opinion, the U.S. government is, is not doing enough in that space, right? So I think that there are some newer models where there are philanthropic groups and nonprofit civil society organizations that are trying to think through ways to, to lean into that space more. But there are some, you know, some sort of um, smaller programs that do exist. The Treasury Department has this um, Tropical Forest, let's see if I can get the whole acronym, Tropical Forest um, Conservation Coral Reef um, Act, which is a debt for nature swap program. And so if country X has um, pristine forests or, or coral reefs and outstanding debt to usually USAID, then um, the U.S. government can forgive that debt and those resources that would have gone to pay those, um, those debt payments will instead go into a fund to help conserve either that forest or that coral reef. So there are some programs like that that do exist. Um, would any other panelists like to weigh in on that in response to Sharon's question? Go ahead, Valerie. Just to note that um, there are a number of ways in which um, nature can be mainstreamed in a number of programs that exist already at the multilateral institutions, for instance, because nature is such an integral part of um, the economy um, and it's, it's the bedrock really of our economies. There are ways to mainstream um, our action on nature within the projects that are delivered on the ground so that um, they, um, they actually de deliver for, um, for the communities that rely on natural on nature as their, um, as their environment to, uh, to, um, and their on, well, for, for whom the livelihoods depend on nature. And that is uh, increasingly um, an, an emerging um, topic of research and a number of my colleagues in the, the World Resources Institute are, are um, specialized in those nature-based solutions and work with these institutions to embed that nature element in the projects um, that these institutions deliver on the ground. Good, thanks. Our next question is over here, Maggie, in the middle of this sort of block of seats. Um, and if you wanna get in line for the next question, otherwise, uh, oh, there you go, that was easy. Thanks. Um, I'm Julia. I'm an economist trainee at the USITC. First of all, thank you all for your presentation. They were all very informative. Um, my question is about private finance and how it can be scaled and invited more. Um, Stacey, you mentioned blended finance, but I'm curious, like, which mechanisms you all think are maybe the most promising for the U.S. specifically? Because um, while carbon pricing, pricing seems to take off a bit in the EU with like the EU ETS, I don't know how likely that is in the U.S., um, so I'm curious what you think about mechanisms like green bonds or carbon pricing here. This is such a large topic. Um, so uh, if you divide the world into kind of um, private financing that doesn't need any kind of blending of any any type or incentives of any type, um, some really exciting things are happening and have been over the last seven, eight years. One is that because we are better able to... Um, identify, assess, and quantify climate-related financial risks in, a, in, in different ways. It's um, starting to show up in rating agencies. Um, both oh, S&P, Fitch, and Moody's have all acquired, built, and grown climate-related analytics teams that are um, being 
used to help um, quantify certain types of um, financial risks that could come about for certain types of assets. So what is the revenue cost or asset impact from certain types of climate impacts that are on the horizon, mostly physical, that's where they t tend to be more comfortable. Transition is a whole different kind of exercise. Um, but uh, that is bringing, building awareness and understanding among investors about this being a financial risk. It's drawing those connections, which is really important. The other thing is we're seeing a lot, a lot, a lot of dynamism in the insurance sector. Now, insurance in this country is very complicated, federal, state, local, and insurance and reinsurance. But the fact is, is that you have 13 insurance companies that went bankrupt in Florida in the last 11 months, not 12 months, 11 months. Um, these are um, frontline underwriters are having a hard time underwriting a portfolio of hazards or perils, as insurance people tend to call them. And that, um, as it, for those hazards or perils that have climate fingerprints, they're starting to get out of the business or being forced to go bankrupt. That's also a signal, a risk signal for investors. There's a lot more to that than just that headline, and insurance is a really dy dynamic and interesting industry. But mainstream climate, uh, mainstream financial sector is really starting to take this very seriously, not as a do-good thing, but also as a, my, I've got to protect my financial upside thing. Um, or said a different way, I look at a whole bunch of risks when I make an investment. Now I have to look at climate change, too, because that actually has financial risks. So that's positive in my view, because that's behavioral change for investment. I think you couple that with the um, catalytic incentives that um, some of the policies, federal and state, that are out there, and you have created real momentum around an investment thesis that investors are really excited about. Um, one of the things, you know, there's consequences of all these things, but one of the things that you see at a global scale is you see a lot of funding coming to the United States because of the way we are repositioning the um, positive investment potential here around climate uh, because of the IRA and the GHGRF that's on the horizon. So there's a lot more to say about that. But um, the blended part is really where you take the public patient concessional capital to catalyze private investment when it might otherwise not happen, filling some gaps there. That's also happening in, at a scale that we've not seen ever before, and which is pretty exciting. So. Great. Uh, any other comments from Thank our you. panel on that? Elizabeth? Just very quickly, I just wanted to double down on what Stacey was saying about the IRA. I mean, um, the economic policy team at Treasury has done some really um, good, quick analysis for IRA investments. And the numbers are something like 100 projects announced, um, totaling $200 billion over that first year period. And the guidance isn't done yet, right? I mean, we're still waiting for these poor tax economists and, and tax lawyers at the Treasury Department to figure out exactly what the rules are going to look like for certain portions of the IRA. And, um, and yet still, we're seeing this enormous investment in the United States based because of the IRA incentives um, that was passed just a little over a year ago. Great. Thank you. And I promised that we would get to you for your last question. Really? Word for word. Incredible. Word, but they answered the question I was going to ask. OK, fair enough. Well, we are just about at time. Um, I'm going to do a quick rapid fire question just to give every panelist an opportunity to give a last word. And it's a little bit of a, ver it's a, a variation of the one we talked about before. I'm going to give you an option. You can either give us uh, an answer to one or both of these questions. What is the biggest change or shift? And this is, this is lightning round. So this is you know lightning round. What is the biggest change or shift you've seen in international climate finance since COP27? You also may answer, what is the biggest international climate finance issue you look forward to seeing addressed at COP28? And Joe, perhaps we'll start at you and we'll just run down the line uh, interested in what you think about that. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, it's hard to do really quickly, but I think, I think yes. for me, the biggest shift has been uh, the scale of, of finance that we're starting to talk about. We, we are well past the, you know, the 100 billion goal hasn't been met, to be very clear, and it should be uh, urgently. But I think we're now, as, as Stacey mentioned, we're talking all entirely in the trillions um, uh, in terms of, um, of finance needs. And I think that's been a really helpful shift because it really focuses minds. So when, we, when we're talking about reforming the multilateral development banks, reforming the international financial institutions, um, we have a benchmark to measure it against. Last year at COP, pretty much, 
there was a, a, a report by uh, Vera Songwe and Nick Stern led this high-level commission on climate finance. Mm. And for the first time, they had a really clear number on what the needs, the finance needs, climate finance needs in developing countries were, 2.4, 2 to 2.8 uh, trillion a year, so 2.4 in the middle, um, by 2030, of which a, a, a trillion of that um, would need to come from international sources, public and private. So now we have a benchmark. So when you see the MDB saying, well, we're going to, uh, with these reforms, we're going to get $20 billion more a year, it's like, nice, cool, but we, we, we need to be aiming for, for a trillion. And, and what, what role should they be pl playing towards making up that trillion dollars? So I think that's been really helpful. And I'm looking forward to those conversations continuing. Thanks. Valerie, your lightning round response? Sure. So for me, it is this realization that is um, amplifying that public um, and private funds will be needed and as well as domestic and international. It's like all hands on deck and coming from all the sources of that spaghetti diagram that was shown earlier on. Um, so that is really the quantity effect that um, that needs to happen and is really needed. Uh, one nugget of good good news coming from the MDBs is the fact that um, their uh, climate finance to developing countries has been increasing this year um, and that is uh, sorely needed and also the share of adaptation uh, finance um, has increased slightly since uh, since the past uh, years so that is really adaptation that it, adaptation finance that those countries that need it the most um, will uh, will definitely uh, be counting on and that share of adaptation finance rising is a small nugget of uh, of hope for the the years to come thanks stacy i will pick up on that i've got a lot of thoughts but i'll pick up on that one which is not just a share of adaptation financing but the share of private investment in adaptation and resilience i think that has been a big shift in the last uh really recent couple of years but you know again we have locked in enough warming that we have we're seeing and feeling and experiencing the effects Adaptation and resilience has to start now. Uh, really should have started a long time ago, but th that share really needs to grow. Um, and as it relates to mitigation, energy transition, I actually think we have 20 years of experience to think more creatively about how to be efficient with our public dollars to maximize private investment. And that's also showing at the COP, uh, at last year's COP and at this year's COP in terms of the people that are at the table. Um, the stakeholders from the private invest investor set who are interested in the low carbon uh, net zero transition um, is just growing, and that's great. Thanks. And Elizabeth, you get the last word today. Um, thanks. And I'm going to pick up from that, from what Stacey was just talking <laughs> about. Um, at COP26, you will have seen these huge numbers of private banks, $130 trillion of assets under management committed to net zero. What I'm most excited about are um, those banks actually developing their transition plans and figuring out what that means. They all sort of got together because Mark Carney asked them to, to get their announcements together, and it was really impactful and an important signal. What it means today is that now we have these enormous financial firms that are actually holding their clients to account, asking for transition plans, and then themselves developing their own to figure out exactly what that means to be net zero with a five-year target with a 10-year target, with a 15-year target. And I'll do a last plug. The U.S. Treasury Department put out principles for net zero. Um, just recently, Secretary Yellen announced that at Climate Week in September. Check it out. It's good reading. Great. Thank you very much. I think our panelists deserve our applause today for being such... Thanks to everybody for joining us. We hope to see you back on November 7th for what's on the table for the negotiations. And then we'll be back on November 27th uh, for the first global stock take. That first global stock take one will be online only because that's the day before Anna and I leave for Dubai. Um, but the other one, the one on November 7th, I think will be in the gold room in Rayburn. So you won't want to miss that. Um, I would like to um, thanks or uh, share thanks once again to Representative Espeot and his great staff for joining us today via video remarks and sharing his thoughts. Major thanks to Representative Tonko and his fantastic team, you specifically, uh, and the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Co Environment Coalition for helping us get this great room today. Uh, it is, these, these rooms, I know they're a little inconvenient, but like the technology is really good and it's really good. So thank you very much for that. Um, big thanks to my colleagues at EESI. I'd like to thank Dan O, uh, Anna, Omri, 
uh, Molly, Nicole, Allison, and Aaron. Um, we met Laura and Maggie because one of them had the clipboard and the other had the mic. But Zoe was taking photos, and she's our other amazing intern uh, this fall, so big thanks to you. And Troy, couldn't do it without you. Um, all of our live cast audience uh, owes you a debt of gratitude as well. And I will close with uh, once again saying thanks and uh, get well soon to Bella. We look forward to um, being able to see you again soon. I uh, hope you're feeling better. We'll go ahead and wrap there. Sorry for going a little over, but uh, we'll be back on November 7th. Thanks. <laughs>